You guys ready? Are you guys ready? Are you, are you ready for 48 weeks of the supernatural? Yeah. No, I am not kidding. We're doing a study of the 12 apostles. We're doing a study of 12 um, uh, uh, mystic saints, including random desert fathers. We're also going to dive into the 19th century um, uh, restoration of the healing gifts. Through, um, we're going to pick uh, 12 um, uh, generals, uh, looking at um, everyone from John Alexander Dowie to, to um, uh, Mariah Woodworth Eder to, uh, uh, to William Branham. And then we're going to go into 12 modern day contemporary living supernaturalists. 12, 12, 12, 12, okay? It's going to be it's going to be wild. It's kind of a long-term commitment, and uh, hopefully you guys are down for it. Um, but I'm super excited. In fact, I think this may be one of the deepest dives of this kind of journey um, that I've ever seen actually rolled out kind of in a corporate uh, sort of context. And so this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, the reason why we're doing this is because um, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so if you want to see God do something in your generation, then you have to reflect on and speak about what he did in the previous generations. He loves to be talked about. Holy Spirit loves to be talked about. Even the angels of God love to be talked about. Not worship, to be talked about. The supernatural. When we begin to talk about the supernatural, it begins to create a glory realm. You begin to feel the atmosphere begin to change. You begin to feel the angels of God begin to show up. You begin to feel the glory of God begin to descend. And all of a sudden, um, you, you're, uh, yeah, 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 all of a sudden you start to get a little bit intoxicated, amen? <laughs> All right, we're going to try to stay relatively sober until the end, um, and then we'll just, just see what Jesus um, wants to do. But I know that he wants to do something in our generation and in our nation, and I know he wants to use you. We are going to honor, in this series, the interrupters, the men and women of God that he has used to bring heaven to earth. And we're going to celebrate them. And we're going to honor them. And yet, at the same time, I so believe that the next move of God will not be so much about the man of God as it is the people of God, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. Just clear me right now, God wants to use me. Yeah, God wants to use me. Listen, I got good news for you. As we're going to learn tonight, God loves to use ridiculous people. God loves to use the weirdos. He loves to use the unqualified. He loves to use the disqualified. <laughs> As again, at weirdo, weirdos, weird, yeah, yeah. There used to be a church, I don't know, maybe they're still, I don't, uh, their marketing campaign was no weird stuff. And I don't, I don't know, but, but I, sometimes I wonder if the church has become far too secular for the world. When you look at all of the world religions, when you look at spirituality within millennialism, okay, um, when you look at Gwyneth Paltrow, they're really big into weird stuff. Why? Because uh, there's a generation that says, listen, there, there's everything that I can feel and see. There's this thing that we call reality, and yet I know there is more. And if the more offends me, I'm okay with that. This generation is not looking for a spirituality that will fit into our box. This generation is looking for a spirituality that will break the box. It's like we all know, we all know that there's more. That there's more. And to a certain degree, we all kind of feel like we're in kind of the matrix and we all want to kind of unplug. To discover Reality. And so when we're going through this series, there's going to be times when we go a little too far according to your grid. There's going to be times when maybe you get a little bit of, uh, offended. There's going to be times when we maybe cross your line. And, and, and that needs to be okay. And here's my commitment to you. We will always keep it Jesus-centric. So we're into the deeper stuff. We, we, we are. Okay? But... If you ever get past Jesus, you've gone too far. He is the gateway. So if you have to, if you have to start um, creating new gateways, 
you're part of the wrong religion. You're part of the wrong, the wrong system. There are good people, Christians, that do ridiculous things to access places in the spirit. Why? Because they've been tricked into thinking that Jesus isn't enough. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. You do not need to add anything to Jesus. And so, yes, we're going to read we're going to read of some people that ascribed to some, you know, you know. In fact, <laughs> every person that we study is going to have some major major issues. And I'm not going to try to sweep their issues under the rug. This is what this is why because their issues encourage me. Why? Cuz I got a lot of issues. Now, I'd like to believe that I have less issues than I did years ago, but this is what I know. I'm still in process, and this is what I love. I love that we have examples, biblical examples. I love the fact that how gritty the Bible is. I love the fact that, that you get to read that the failure of David made it in the Word of God. I, I, I love that. And, and the reason why I love that is because it reveals the character and nature of a father who is merciful. And that we are qualified, not because of our talents, not because of our abilities, not because I was born in Bellevue. That's awesome, okay? But some of us were born in Renton, okay? And, and listen, listen, come on. I'm a product of Valley General Hospital, okay? Could be a soap opera, Valley General. Dylan, you said you love me. Um, listen, it doesn't matter where you're born. It doesn't matter where you went to, went to school. It does, you know, here's the thing, that if your heart is beating, if you've got blood pumping, that you are not your own idea. You're part of a God dream. And he has formed you and framed you for such a time as this. Now, what, here's, here, here's another thing that we need to talk about. Our faith, as we're going to see, this is a study of the battle for the supernatural within the church. And our study is going to reveal that these apostles, starting our first 12 weeks, okay, um, that really what qualified them was not the depth of their cognitive knowledge or was not the the letters that followed their name okay it was not that they had their masters or their doctorate that's all that is all that is all good Um, but what qualified them was that they loved Jesus they followed Jesus and signs and wonders followed them in fact to be a Christian okay in the first century meant you were supernatural okay follow me you are supernatural. Why? Because you've got a spirit that is powering you right now. How do I know that? There's no battery in you. In fact, scientists can't even figure out what powers us. Like how this energy, like where, where is this, what, where is this energy, this conscious, like science can't even figure it out. They're, they're trying to define, they think they can export your consciousness into a USB stick, but they have no idea what it is. We're going to do this. Okay, then what is it? We don't know. Yeah, okay, good luck with that. What is it? That is your spirit. You are powered by a spirit. You are powered by God breath. As Eberly calls the God stuff. You're powered by that. You are a super, listen now. Listen now, I'm going to preach at you for a quick second. Then I'm going to go into study mode, okay? So have fun now because it's about to, you know. Okay. <laughs> You are a supernatural being, and your faith, if you subscribe to Christianity, is 100% supernatural from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And if you remove the supernatural from your Bible, then um, you don't have Christianity. So we don't get to say, well, I'm not a supernaturalist. That's Bobby Connor. That's, that's William Branham because of how they were born. They had a mystical birth. You know, um, Bobby Connor, he'll be here in March. Um, his mom tried to abort him with a coat hanger, and the hand of God came into her womb and moved him aside so that the coat hanger wouldn't kill him. The Lord showed that to him in a vision. He went and asked his mom about it, and she says, every word you said is true. 
That's a supernatural birth story. You read William Branham, that's a supernatural birth story. Every single one of us has a supernatural birth story. You are a spirit sent from heaven, wrapped in the DNA of your parents, okay? And let's be honest, even wrapped in the fracturedness of our parents, And then in Christ, there is an epiphany moment where all of a sudden we begin to wake up to the reality that we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. You will see in the 12 apostles this this normal, supernatural Christianity. It's normal. They didn't call it revival. They just called it Christianity. I love supernatural stuff happens in the church. We're in revival. Well, in the first century, no, this is just what it means to be a Christian. God shows up. Yeah, this is just what it means. God shows up. He just shows up. And then all of a sudden, as we will see, um, uh, compromise starts to come into the church. This thing that was very natural and organic becomes just one big system. It becomes a big Roman um, corporation. And yet the Roman corporation walks in signs, wonders, and miracles. Which is why when Martin Luther revolts with the Reformation, he says, you can keep your supernatural. We want gospel-centeredness. And there is, during the Reformation, a divorce of the supernatural from Christianity. And I'm using loose terms, and we'll bring more definition as we go. And it's not really to the beginning of the 19th century that we begin to see a restoration of the gifts. And the, guys, this has just been the last hundred years that we have seen a restoration of the gifts. In, off, in fact, the gifts, really it's just been what? In the last maybe 30 years that we've seen a restoration of the actual offices of the prophet, the apostle, the pastor, the teacher, and the evangelist. Hopefully I did that right. Yep, let's just say I did. Just in the last three years that we've seen the restoration of the offices. And even then, to a great degree, many Christians struggle with the idea that God has given to his church five distinct diverse offices. And I believe that we are continuing to see a restoration of these things. And I believe that we are about to see a revival of the offices. I believe we are about to see a mighty river of God, a river of God that is so wild and it is so big that it activates and employs the office of the apostle and the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, and the evangelist. And all of a sudden, we begin to see people emerging and coming into their thing, and they are celebrated for who they are. They're not kicked out because they're different, because we've got a grid and a theology that sets this thing up. I believe that God has been preparing our nation and our generation for a move of God so as he begins to move, we don't shut down what he's trying to do. Okay, awesome. So we are calling this the interrupters. This is the men and the women that throughout history brought heaven to earth. And what we're going to do is tonight we're going to begin in week one with um, Simon Peter. Okay, we're going to begin with uh, what I'll refer to as the, uh, the first disciple, if you will. And I'll refer to him as this because he's going to become kind of the, the leader, the captain of the disciples. He was also called uh, Cephas by uh, Jesus. Now, I'm just going to be going kind of through this. And again, um, as we're going through through the life of, of Peter, I want for the testimony and record of who he is to come and to motivate you, to come and capture who you are, that God took a, a guy, a blue-collar worker, this would be like Jesus walking through Boeing one day and saying, come and follow me, and hey, by the way, you're about to lead my church. Yeah, this is so fascinating. So, um, Peter... He was known as Simon Peter. He was called Cephas by Jesus. He was one of the 12 disciples. He was also one of the first leaders of the early church. The thing about Peter, which is interesting, is that he's kind of sassy. He's kind of rash. He's kind of hasty. He's a little bit short-tempered. In fact, Peter, when it comes to being kind of a rabbi or a leader in the church, is not qualified. Um, Religiously, he's fairly incompetent. But he's very, very passionate. This is my story uh, completely. When I uh, became a pastor, I was 27 years old. I don't know if that should be legal. Um, but it was, it was God. I had done Bible school, okay, which was great. I had my four-year degree in Bible and theology. That meant absolutely zip. 
the only thing that qualified me was the call and the grace and the mentoring and equipping that I had from our pastors and elders here at SRC. Now, God used aspects of those things, but I can tell you I, 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 I lacked a lot of competence, and I kind of compensated with passion. And that is sort of like, that is sort of like Peter, okay? Uh, now, when it comes to Peter, uh, he grew up in a fishing town in the northern part of the Sea of Galilee, uh, Bethsaida, and was a fisherman with his younger brother, Andrew. And they used to fish together with James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Now, what's fascinating is that um, how Peter gets set apart um, is through the supernatural. We read of a story where uh, Peter and his homeboys are fishing, and they can't catch anything. Um, And this guy shows up. This dude shows up. um, And he says, um, how are you guys doing? And they say, we're not doing very well. And he says, "Uh, well, maybe try throwing your uh, nets on the other side of the boat. They throw their nets on the other side of the boat, and they catch a supernatural, let's just say they catch a reckless amount of fish, meaning that they began to harvest more than they could handle. That's a word for someone. <laughs> I'm just going to take a drink to that. They, they began to harvest more than they can handle. And this is the fascinating thing about the miracles of Jesus. And this is what catches Peter's attention. And uh, Jesus shows up and and Peter's like, whoa, 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 okay, who are you? And Jesus says, I want you to quit your job. I want you to to lay everything down. And I want you to to come and follow me. You know what Peter says? (sighs) Okay, let's do it. Peter is going to follow Jesus. He's going to be there when Jesus does the same thing that he does with the fishies at the very first miracle, you know, when they ran out of wine and Jesus turns the water into wine. He's going to be there when Jesus multiplies the bread and the fishes. And time and time again, Jesus through the miraculous and the supernatural is going to bring about a harvest that's always more than enough. He's going to experience the generosity of the Father made manifest through Jesus. And this place where Jesus doesn't just show up to meet our needs. He shows up to exceed our needs and to meet the needs of others. This is part of the purpose of the supernatural. It's not just for shock and awe. But it's to show up and to change the expectation dynamic within a generation. That it would raise the bar as far as what we are asking God for. Because when you see God show up and exceed what you even asked him for. God just did this here at, at Seattle Revival Center. We experienced an, a, an abundance miracle in the month of December. In that we were going to try to raise $35,000 um, for all these really cool projects in the nation. So we said, here we go. We're going to need everybody to, to, to be a part. And let's, let's pray and obey and let's believe God for 35000 And what did the Lord do? We brought in... Just under $100,000 in the month of December. Okay, listen. That has nothing to do with a red envelope project. That has nothing to do with even the project that we were raising funds for. That has everything to do with the Lord raising the bar here at Seattle Revival Center, saying, if I was able to exceed your needs with that project, I am preparing you. I'm raising your bar of expectation because he is looking for a generation that will trust him and to ask him for big things. And it got the attention of a bunch of unbelieving fishermen. When God shows up and, bless, and blesses people, they didn't even deserve it. Man, they were out there listening to their dre with their chewing tobacco, saying whatever kinds of words. And Jesus shows up and says, you don't even believe in me yet, and yet I want to bless you. The kindness of God leads men to repentance. And you're going to need to know how to walk in abundance miracles. Not for yourself, but to be an 
true image bearer of Jesus. You're going to need to walk into situations where you know there's lack, and you're going to need to know how to release the abundance of heaven. Not me, okay, you, okay. Jesus, he always refers to Peter uh, as Cephas or rock, and the rest of the guys don't. (laughs) And even when Peter is referred to as, they don't call him rock, but Jesus is always calling him rock. Jesus is always calling out his true identity. Jesus is like, I don't care what everybody else calls you. You're a rock. I am carving you, Peter. I am doing something in you. According to the Gospel of John, uh, uh, Jesus met uh, Simon Peter, and he immediately called him by his new Jesus name right off the bat. Hi, I'm Peter. No, you're not. You're rock. You're the rock. I like that. All right. We see that Peter's not immediately seen as the leader. He's kind of this hot-headed dude. Um, but we see that Peter continues to seek after the Lord. We see that uh, 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 Peter continues to follow Christ. Peter continues to uh, be there for all of these supernatural exploits that Jesus is, is doing. Um, uh, uh, and then over time, we see that Peter's leadership capacity and authority begins to grow. We know that the, the 12 disciples, they follow Jesus for three years. They're following him. They're loving him. They're watching him. They're being rebuked by him. Listen now. Um, rebuke is not the same as rejection. Rebuke is an opportunity to upgrade. Yeah, 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 yeah. Man, how many of you love it when somebody loves you enough to level with you? That's what we're going to need this next year. We're going to need leaders who love people enough to, in honor, to level with us and say, I'm not saying this to reject you. I'm saying this to invite you up to the next level. You know, it, like Peter was the one that finally was like, oh my gosh, I know who you are now. You are the son of God, right? right. And moments later, <laughs> this is offensive. Jesus was offensive. I think God, I'm not offensive. Jesus He's offensive, okay? Um, And, you know, Jesus called him Satan. He called Peter Satan. Listen, people people would quit the church if I was like, go home, Satan. (laughs) Pastor Darren, can we talk about something you said in the message? No, Satan, go home. (laughs) Get behind me. My face doesn't even, talk to the hand. Satan, because <laughs> the face ain't listening, right? Like, that's really, that's, that's super, that's super, that's super offensive. And yet, what does Peter do? He just continues to follow Jesus. He just continues, he makes mistakes, he does all kinds of things. At one point, you know, the, the, even up to the point when the Romans come after, come after Jesus, you know, and Peter was the disciple with the not today Satan t-shirt on. Even there in the, you, <laughs> Even there in the garden, the Romans come after Jesus, and, and, and he's the one that has a concealed, you know, you know no, no, he, takes, he takes their sword, which is super Jack Bauer. Like, they, they come after him, and he's like, sink, 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 think. Can you hear me now? <laughs> right? And Jesus is like, oh. Jesus is like, Peter, gosh, come on, dude, that's not how we roll, Right? And Jesus t- picks up the ear and puts it right back on the guy, right? Like, Jesus, all the way up to that moment, is doing, like, re- healing services with the very guys that are about to kill him. This is so fat, like, like so, so, so crazy. What about, what about the, the moment when, when Jesus takes Peter, James, and John? And takes them up on the high mountain by themselves. And there, right in front of them, Jesus begins to transfigure. The word there means to metamorph. The word there means to transform right in front of their eyes. And the face of Jesus begins to shine like the sun. And his clothes become as white as light. And then, Moses shows up. with Elijah. And Peter is looking over at James and John and is like, are you guys seeing this? Like, we're seeing, so 
<laughs> Good. We're not, hopefully we're not dead. Look at, <laughs> guys, track with me here. They're on the mountain. Jesus, his face is transforming. He's transfiguring right in front of them. And Moses and Elijah are there. And what does Peter do? He starts talking. <laughs> the first guy to talk. It's not God. It's not Elijah. Right? Like, this is a discipleship moment. This is, Peter, hey, next time Moses and Elijah show up, you shut up. <laughs> you shut that. You shut up, Peter. Like, when they show up, you shut up. Next, okay. This is Peter. He says, uh, <laughs> this is Peter. He says, Lord, is it cool if we're here? <laughs> That's, that I, that's exactly what he says. He says, Lord, just, just checking, like, you invited us, right? He, he, and then he, this is what he says. Hey, um, this, is, this is amazing. He goes, maybe we should build taberma- tabernacles for the three of you. Maybe, like, he wants to go to work. Like, like he's so, this is such an awkward moment. This is Jesus, like, wah, 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 face. His, ha- his, his, his hair, his, his clothes are going invisible. Every, everything's glowing. There's Moses, like, Moses, he's probably got just a bomb beard going on. Just hair, just like, rah. And, and Elijah, are you kidding me? Like, the, the fear of the Lord must have been over everything. And Peter's just like, uh, can, we, can you give us something to do? This is super awkward. This is super crazy. And while Peter, look at this is, and while Peter is still speaking, a bright cloud covered the whole lot of them, and a voice comes from the cloud. So the cloud covers them, and then a voice begins to reverberate and resonate in the whole in, in them and around them. The audible voice of God that says, "This is my son, whom I." Love and I am pleased with him. Listen to him. And when they heard this, Peter, James, John, they they fall down to the ground, and it says they are terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. He said, "Get up, don't be afraid." He goes, "I know this is a. I I know you haven't. I know you haven't experienced something like this before. (laughs) Perfectly normal, perfectly healthy. Go ahead, get up." I know you're, you're, we're in a cloud that's talking. Isn't this awesome? Jesus is so cool. Even, even then, Jesus is so cool. Because if it were me, and I was Jesus, I would just be like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> laughing at him, you know. Like that, like, and Jesus is just like, dudes, we're still dudes. Right there in the middle of all of this, and they're like, what then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus replied, to be sure Elijah comes, oh, and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they didn't recognize him, but have done to him everything that they wish. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. And the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. Okay. This would be um, the first time that they get to be an audience in the presence of Jesus as he's engaging in this way. But we do know that Jesus separates and goes and prays often, but never takes anyone with him. I wonder why. (laughs) This is the recorded account of the encounter of Jesus at one of the special times when he invites a few of his friends. But what kinds of things happen when he didn't invite his friends? We also know that this act of transfiguration, this act where the, where the spirit of the Lord comes and there is a transformation or a metamorphosis where there is a... Um, uh, where the face begins to glow, where, where people begin to go uh, tran- translucent, where people begin to go invisible, that, that this uh, became a fairly regular occurrence throughout church history. The Catholic Church would call this, this phenomenon, they would call it luminous phenomenon. That's a good name for it. They came up with five criteria to discern if the luminous phenomenon was legit in the various encounters that were coming in. We are coming into a day when I start to get emails 
and the board of elders here have to go through to discern if your luminous phenomenon is legit. Pastor Darren, it's so much work being a pastor. Yes, it is a lot of work. We're, we're always trying to discern if our people who are glowing and floating and transforming in front of people, we're trying to figure out if it's legit or not. A uh, good friend, Charlie Champ, wrote a book called uh, Transfigured. You should, you should get it if you haven't. Um, and this is where um, I got some of the historical um, uh, uh, data behind how the Catholic Church defined the legitimacy of transfiguration. You want to hear about it? Awesome. Criteria number one, did the phenomenon take place in full daylight or during the night? If the event took place at night, was the light more brilliant than any other light? That was the first condition. They wanted to eliminate exaggerations and someone trying to make a name for themselves. Who would ever try to use supernatural phenomenon to make a name for themselves? Come on, nobody would ever do that. Number two, was, you'll get used to me. If you, <laughs> sorry, that, that's my gift of sarcasm. So Elijah had it. I got a verse. Okay, number two. Was the light a mere spark or was it prolonged so that the observer had time to gaze upon the person and become convinced of its reality? They wanted to make sure that the light was not confused with a light from a natural source, like a lamp or a street light. Also, did the phenomenon take place um, more than once? This is really important when it came to, to distinguish this particular manifestation of transfiguration. They wanted to make sure that it wasn't just a one-time deal. Some of the stories um, that are shared in his book um, uh, uh, speak of, and we'll be studying these people, by the way. This is a little teaser of what's to come, of people that walked in a transfiguration occurrence throughout their ministries. Uh, such powerful experiences... Uh, cannot be regulated only to the saints of the first century or the mystics of the first 12 centuries. If it happened for them, it could also happen for others in any generation, including our own. There are times when one is so close to the presence of God that their faces begin to glow. It is the, re the resemblance of Christ in them, the hope of glory, which would begin to manifest as has happened to others who had transformation experiences. Criteria number three, was the light produced during a religious act, an ecstasy, a sacred personal time, a sermon, or a prayer? They wanted to know what triggered the event. It would then possess a religious nature. Um, it, had to, it had to have taken place during a session of prayer where they were caught up in ecstatic states, or they were taking the Eucharist, or in church, or mass, and a person or saint would begin to illuminate light. St. Teresa of Avila, we'll study her, would be so caught up in the glory of God and enraptured in the realms of the Spirit. Many times, only at just hearing the name Jesus, she would have a manifestation of an illumination that would project out of her. It means light would, be, light would begin to come up and out of her. Um, Bobby Connor, uh, another story. He's got countless pictures on his phone of him glowing. People, people taking pictures of him, and he's just got, he's got light coming out of everywhere. Uh, so, yes. Okay, good. All right. Criteria number four. Since God does not permit such manifestations to satisfy vague curiosity, but only for the good of souls, therefore the event must be beneficial for the intervention of divine grace or lasting conversion. God does not manifest in someone's life just so that they can have a story to tell for others. Listen, when you, it is so important that we expose, it is so important that we honor the prophets. It is so important that we get into um, environments. I, I, I was on the uh, uh, call this last week with, with Pastor Sam from, um, from Honolulu. Um, uh, uh, that's not right, is it? Pastor Sam from Oahu. And um, uh, actually, today is his first Sunday as lead pastor. Um, and he's taken over a real cool church. COVID has transformed the church, believe it or not. They have grown from about 30 people to about 200 in the last year and a half. And um, yeah, it, 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 phenomenal story. And this is what he was saying. He was saying, if God is moving anywhere, if it's the supernatural power of God that's being released anywhere, I need it. No, no, no. It's not that I just want it. I actually need it. And the way that I get it 
is to honor what God is doing in that place. And this is what he said. He goes, God's doing something in Seattle. I can see it. And I need it. And I thought that was absolutely incredible. We should be like that, shouldn't we? I, I, I repented when I heard that because I was like, I don't think that way. I don't, I don't just naturally think that way. But I want to think that way. Because when we think that way, all of a sudden we realize that there's a diversity of outpourings and anointings and things that are available throughout the greater kingdom, okay, and that as we go and receive, it can unlock a part of our identity and destiny. Okay, for example, there's a part of our identity and destiny here at Seattle Revival Center that was unlocked because of what God did through a South African named Rodney Howard Brown who laid his fat hand on the head of Randy Clark who did not feel a thing but then began to go and lay hands on others and that move went from Randy right to Pensacola, Florida through Steve Hill and uh, and that move began to take off and, 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 be, and, 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 and lives were, were changed. You got Michael Brown, you got the fire move. We got uh, Eric and Jenny McCoy, right, who are changing nations, right, because of the anointing that was on um, uh, 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 Michael Brown and 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 and, and, and their relationship um, uh, with with him. And, and then we begin to see um, my dad goes to Toronto with two other pastors, and they get radically, uh, uh, they get power. Of God hits them. My dad begins to vibrate uncontrollably um, uh, to the point where even when he's sleeping, his body is vibrating even while he's sleeping. He would vibrate the screws out of his glasses. Um, a, a good majority of the church thought that he was demon-possessed and left the church. We had people picketing. They were talking smack about us on the radio. It was like, like we got like all, all of this stuff. They paid a great price so that we could have the kinds of conversations that we have tonight. The supernatural is somewhat normal within the church. Be, you know, really, because of these people that ran before us, because of our parents, because of you know, these people that paid a, a great, great price and the courage and the hunger to travel to wells no matter where they were at. Listen, my dad was so hungry that he traveled to Canada. I don't know if I'm that hungry. He was so hungry that he went to Toronto because he was burnt out and he was going to quit. When you find out that God is moving, be hungry for it, be zealous for it. When you find out the power of God is manifesting, you find out that the power of God is breaking out in a connect group. If you find out the power of God is breaking out at a church um, down the street, man, get into it, so into it, honor it, receive it. Why? Because we are the kingdom of God. We are the body of Christ. There is no competition in the glory. There is no competition competition in the glory it's the glory of God and he wants to unlock this kind of unity in the kingdom unity is a really 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 big thing it's the prayer of Jesus in John 17 that we would be one and we see Peter he just wants to be where Jesus is if Jesus is about to do something Peter just wants to be there he wants to see it he wants to argue he wants to ask questions he wants to wrestle he wants to be there and it radically changed his life life. When you get into an atmosphere of the supernatural, the supernatural atmosphere will get into you. And this is what we need is for the glorious supernatural atmosphere to get into us. Just declare right now, I am supernatural. I have the supernatural spirit of Christ in me. And it radically changed, radically changed Peter. All of a sudden, Jesus says, Guys, I got to go, but my spirit's coming. It's going to fill you. Acts chapter 2, they get filled with the glorious Holy Spirit. There's all these mockers. They show up. They begin mocking the church. And Peter stands up. He doesn't deny Christ. No, he did that three times previously. But now he stands up before the mockers, and he preaches an amazing sermon. And the spirit of conviction hits the people. And in one day, the church grows from 120 to 3,000 people because of Peter's first sermon. All of a sudden, we see a uh, moments later, uh, Peter is uh, and John. They're going to uh, uh, they're going to the temple. Um, this is just moments later, and, and we read in um, uh, in Acts chapter three that on their way to the temple, there is a cripple, and he's begging, he's asking for money. And Peter and John say, "I'm sorry, we don't have any money, but something that we have is the power of God, because we've been in environments with Jesus, we've watched him, we've done the." 
the stuff and we're hosting the spirit of Christ Jesus. In the name of Jesus, rise up and rock, walk. And the cripple gets up and begins to walk and he begins leaping and praising God. We see in Acts chapter 5, um, Peter and John are not very popular because they're walking in the power of God. I'm telling you, as we begin to walk in the manifest glory of God, it will cost you your popularity. Why? Because humans get weird when the supernatural shows up. When the supernatural shows up, an antichrist spirit always shows up. It always comes to shut down the anointing. It always comes to shut down the glory. And, and usually it's not even external. It's, it's internal. It's, it's not that it's necessarily you. But there's a spirit of the Antichrist that shows up to bring through fear, through, through doubt, through pride, through jealousy. Um, uh, why? Because if we can partner with that spirit, we will, be, we will be the water upon the fire that the Lord wants to. We always see this pattern that exists that one generation that gets to experience the power of God becomes the defeatist that comes to shut the next move of God down. And we've got to make sure that we don't become such a generate. Now, Peter's not popular, and Peter and John are thrown into jail in Acts chapter 5, and God says, listen, what I've called you to do cannot be done when you are in jail. And so God's like, I'm going to break you out of here. That's pretty supernatural. Imagine you get thrown in jail and all of a sudden, an angel shows up. And that's exactly what happens. An angel shows up and delivers them uh, from jail. So they walk out of the cell. In the same chapter, um, Acts um, chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, says, More and more men and women believed in the Lord, and the Lord added to their number. And as a result, they brought out sick people. They laid them on the streets on beds and mats just so that Peter's shadow... They might fall on them as he passed. But I've done this before. This is fun. Um, Peter did it. I can do it. I have done it. Um, When we're doing street ministry, we'll just say, hey, you stand right here. And then we'll just put our shadow on them. And uh, when I did this with this young man, he started to flip out. He said, "What, what is that? I said, that's the power of God. I am hosting the spirit. And and, and so so you, you can, hey, you can try this at home. They would bring out the sick. So that Peter's shadow might fall on them, and so that he, they would be healed as his... Now, verse 16, crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem. They brought their sick and those tormented by evil spirits. How many know there's a lot of people that are tormented by evil spirits in Seattle? I know because whenever I go down there, they know I'm down there. <laughs> Even when we're in our car, we'll be driving all of a sudden, you know, we'll, we'll have people like, ah, like, is, is, is that guy seriously hissing at us? How many of you have had that? You're just driving down the road, and you, and, and you are triggering the demonic. Hold on. <laughs> and it said that some of them were healed. Wrong. Ah. You know what it says? You know what my Bible says? And all, now, dearly beloved, when we see the word all here, okay, in the Greek, it actually means stinking all. That's the standard. That's, that's the, that's the, ben, that's the benchmark. You know, I, 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 <laughs> I've been in meetings with, with, uh, with Charlie Shamp, and I've seen him do some incredible, I've seen the God, God I've seen the God, I've seen the God use him to do incredible things. And then all of a sudden, I'll, I'll be with him after the meeting, he'll be just bumming out. I'll be like, dude, why are you bummed out? He'll be like, because of that one guy that didn't get healed. I'm like, bro, what about all the people that did get healed? What about the demons that came out of people? Charlie's like, Nah. That one guy should have got healed. Why? Because for Charlie, the standard is all, all, all. Listen, like, so, you know, sometimes it's not in our control. We do everything. We pray. We fast. We do these things. And people leave us people that we love that we know. Oh, my gosh. What, 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 what happened there? But listen, I am not content until all are getting healed. And that doesn't mean that I have to touch them. It doesn't mean that my shadow has to touch. It's just that if I am believing for that place where Pastor Darren come into agreement. I'm in agreement. Boom, it's done. We're raising the bar. We won't allow our past disappointments to frame out our theology. 
We allow the ministry of Christ and the apostles to frame out the possibilities and this statement that Jesus said, greater things than these. Hold up, pause. The, in the Word of God, it actually says that if all the miracles of Jesus were recorded in books, there wouldn't be enough libraries on the earth to contain all, there wouldn't be enough books to contain all of the things that Jesus actually did. And Peter was probably there for all of them. Yeah. And Jesus said, as cool as all that is, you're going to do greater things. You're going to have to want it. You're going to have to be hungry for it. You're going to have to be discontent like Charlie. And when Pastor Darren says, don't be bummed out. Look at everything. They got. You have permission to be like, oh, Pastor Darren, I love you, but I'm not changing the standard. I'm not changing the bar. I know that Jesus has done it all so that all may be set free, so that all may be healed. Listen, that's not for faith evangelists. That's for you. That's for me. That's the bar. That's the standard. If God could use a fisherman like Peter, this guy that was just, you know, a silly guy, he was, he was, silly, he was passionate. He was passionate but not exactly competent. And that dude got to see all. I want to I wanna see stinking all. All, 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 There's a word for the year, all. All in every, all in every. We got to get a vocabulary for all in every, that every heart would be awakened. That's what Paul preaches. He says, I preach to awaken hearts that every person would be awakened to their identity in Christ. Yeah. The paralytic, we see in, uh, in Acts chapter 9, uh, that as Peter's traveling around the country, um, he's vid- vis- visiting the saints, and uh, there's this guy that's paralyzed, and Peter says to him, Jesus heal you, get up, take your mat. And immediately, the guy gets up, takes up his bed, he's radically healed. This is cool. Uh, we see in Acts chapter 9. We just see miracle after miracle. We're following Paul. I love the Acts. The Acts of the Apostles, right? The Acts of the Holy Spirit. The ordinary men and women who are just following, following Jesus. We see um, in Acts chapter 9, verses 36 to 41. And all this will be on YouTube. You can go back and look up all the references. But in Joppa, there was a disciple named uh, Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. Okay, and, um, and we see that she has uh, passed away, and so uh, Peter goes in and, uh, to meet, and he kicks everybody else out of the room. Uh, he says, everybody get out. They're all grieving, He's, uh, and P- Peter's like, I'm not here to grieve, okay? I'm here to execute justice. So everybody, everybody out, everybody out, everybody out, just me. I'm going to stay in here, and then Peter goes over next to the bed, okay, and says, Tabitha, get up, and then she got up. She comes right back to life. That's what we call a resurrection. Isn't that awesome? That he didn't pray, by the way. Isn't it interesting when it comes to these resurrection miracles that we read about? Op, there's, there's very little prayer that happens there. Why? Because, uh, they, because the prayer has led up to that moment. When we pray, when we spend time with Jesus, we are making an investment. Right? So that we can take a withdrawal. When the, when the time is, uh, yeah, that, that, that when, the, when everything hits the fan, that's not the time when you want to figure out your standing in Christ. The time to figure out healing, okay, is not when sickness hits your home. You want to you wanna practice on others. Practice makes perfect. Hey, if doctors practice medicine, it's time for you and I to start practicing healing. Practicing resurrection. I think I've uh, had the honor, and I count it a dear honor, uh, to have uh, gotten to pray for probably five people uh, that were physically dead, where I got, where I got to go and, and lay hands and say, get up. Hey, get up. Trust me, I've tried it. Okay? And let me tell you, the very first time, it was in, it was in, a, it was in a morgue, the very first time. And here, here in the U.S., not, this is very rare that they'll let you do this kind of stuff. It was a process, too, by the way. I was on the phone with the head of the hospital, and they said, sorry, what do you want to do? 
I said, I would like to pray for the girl. They're like, you understand, she's already passed. Why do you want to pray for her? I said, I would like to pray for her with the intent of resurrection from the dead. Uh, this is an apostolic precedent laid out in the word of God. And we were actually told from Jesus himself to, um, to heal the sick, to cast out demons. And I'm just going through it with the head of the hospital. She says, does the family want it? I said, that's why I'm calling you. They have requested this. They said, we're going to need authorization from the family. They do. And then they let, they let me go in there. Um, and it was awesome. Why? The presence of God was there. Now, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm going to. Amen. Why? Because in second hesitations, it says, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And I, this is what I know. I'm going to pray for more dead people than anyone in this room. But when they start getting up, you're going to know about it. Even just this last year, a, um, an unbelieving uh, family was in the hospital as their, as their child um, was, was dying. And a friend of a friend contacted me. This is an unbelieving family. Um, and they said, we're going we're gonna to take her off the breathing machine tonight. And um, I tried to get into the hospital. There was no way they were going to let me in because of all the COVID regulations. And um, I said, can somebody get me in touch with the parents that are by her bed right now? So they, I, the dad called me. An unbelieving dad called me and said, yes, would you pray for my daughter? So they put, they, they put her on a speaker phone. And, I be, and, and they put the phone right next to her. And I began commanding life back into her body. Commanding life. Commanding life. An unbelieving family. Just commanding life. And again, I could feel the power of, I felt, I, 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 I count one of the highest honors to get to, com, to, to partner with life. To get to partner. And then, um, and then it felt finally appropriate at a certain point in time to let them go. And I said, I covenant with you right now for the next hour to continue praying for your daughter. And Andrew and I sat there. We prayed from 11 p.m. to 12 p.m. We cried out to the Lord. And we, we prayed in tongues. And for a solid hour, we sowed. We sowed into that account. We sowed into that account. I've also been rejected by many, many people when I've reached out and said, hey, can I come and pray for the purpose of resurrection? And I've been told many, many times, no. And what does that mean? It's embarrassing. It, 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 no one likes to get rejected. But it doesn't matter. This is the honor. We can't help ourselves. We're believers. And we are contending for a restoration of the gift of bodily resurrection in our generation, in our generation. This is a fascinating one. Peter, in Acts chapter five, we see a man by the name of Ananias um, who steps into inheritance and he's got all this money and he lies about it. And Peter, through a word of knowledge, knows that he's lying, calls him out, says, bro, man, Satan has filled your heart. You've lied to the Holy Spirit. You're being selfish. You've kept for yourself. And the guy's struck dead. And then his wife shows up. She doesn't know uh, what happened to her husband. Peter asks her, tell me, is this the price that you and Ananias got for the land? She said, yes, this is the price. And Peter said, how could you test the Holy Spirit? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door. They will also carry you out. And she's struck down, dead. The result of that, of course, is the fear of the Lord comes upon everyone that, that begins to hear of that, of that story. Well, then he gets arrested again, thrown in prison again. And we see in Acts chapter 12, God is like, you can't do what I've called you to do while you're locked up. I delivered you once, and I'll do it again. He breaks him out of prison again. 
phenomenal. We see um, a, a guy by the name of uh, Cornelius. He's a Gentile, not a Jew. We haven't seen a, an outpouring of the Spirit upon the Gentiles yet. Uh, Cornelius has a, an incredible vision, and God's like, there's a, there's a bro you need to know. His name is Peter. You need to seek him out. Well, Peter, he's, he wouldn't be open to the bro, okay? Because Peter, he's just into the Jewish thing. He, th- he thinks this whole thing, this whole revival, it's unto the Jews, okay? Well, all of a sudden, okay, he's minding his own business when he goes into a crazy trance. And all of a sudden, uh, this thing comes out of heaven full of unclean animals. And this is one of, my, one of my favorite scriptures. God is like, kill and eat. Now, this is kind of fun because uh, this next week on Thursday, um, I'm going with a, uh, with, a, with a couple of guys over to Texas where we're going to kill an insane amount of hogs, wild hogs that are destroying things over there. So we see it as we're doing Texas a favor. Uh, so I got a big case full of guns, and so do my friends. We got more guns than is normal. And we're going to go over there, and what are we going to do? We're going to kill and eat. Pigs of all things. <laughs> Good times. Ah, I like that. I like the vision. All of a sudden, Peter's like, oh my goodness, this whole thing is changing. And we see Peter um, come together with Cornelius, and we begin to, and we see an outpouring similar to that of the day of Pentecost, but it is upon the Gentiles. Listen, you and I, okay, there's a couple Jews here, but for the most of us, Gentiles, you and I should be very, very grateful for this part in the book of Acts, because we, guys, through Christ Jesus, we have been grafted in to this incredible family, the body of Christ, and we get to participate with the character and nature of, of Jesus. We get to call ourselves sons and daughters of the Most High God. Okay? We, we get to be inheritors. We get to be a part of this royal priesthood. Isn't this awesome? And this is Peter's moment when he realizes, oh my goodness, he's like, oh my goodness, this thing is a lot bigger than I realized. Yeah, yeah. Let me just declare this right now. This thing is a lot bigger than you realized. This river is a lot deeper than you realized. We see Peter. He's got an anointing to preach. And let me tell you, a supernatural competence. You surrender yourself to the Lord, and he will make up for the areas that you are not strong. You, you give him your weakness, and he will show up as strong. We see Peter begins to grow in his competence, in his understanding. He begins to grow in his confidence in Christ. And the Lord begins to use him in radical, radical ways. Again, we see the 3,000 at Pentecost. Immediately after the, the crippled beggar um, gets healed, we see 5,000 people added to um, the church. When you read the book of Acts, you're going to find eight radical sermons from Peter. If God did it with Peter, he can do it through you. And this is phenomenal. And Josh, if you would, if you'd come, that would, that, would, that would be awesome. That Peter, in, towards the end of his life, um, it is believed through church history, Peter would, would write and say that I write, I'm coming to you from Babylon. It's believed that Peter did go to Rome, and there in Rome, he was persecuted by Nero, and it is believed, according to church history, that Peter was also um, a martyr and was crucified. And what's fascinating about what is understood about Peter is his declaration of not being worthy to be sacrificed in the same manner as Jesus but the request to be crucified upside down. I love this painting. I love a a lot of the paintings that we were... From a fisherman, minding his own business, he thought he understood where he was going with his life. He, from a small fishing town, doing his thing with his brother, with his friends, and then one day Jesus shows up and changes everything. He had no idea that he would get to follow this man named Jesus. God made flesh. He had no idea that the Lord was going to use him the way that the Lord used him. Just because Jesus said, come and follow me. And he said, yes. If you want to be a part of what Jesus is doing on the earth, you don't have to be impressive. You don't have to have an incredible resume. 
All you have to have is a yes. When you say yes to the Lord, all of a sudden, Jesus begins to change everything. And that's the pattern. The pattern is, is Jesus likes to interrupt things, and then he likes to change everything. Let me ask you tonight, what do you need Jesus to interrupt? What patterns have been established within your own life that you said, I guess this is just going to be my normal. I guess this is just going to be the new normal. But you know you are settling for less than God's, God's very best. And my question is tonight, are you willing to give him your yes? Say, I, I can't control, I can't control the outcome. But Jesus, I'm willing to give you my entire life. I'm willing to give you my yes. I'm willing to lay it all down to follow you. And when you give him your yes, he will show up. He will show off. But I'm telling you, just like with Peter, it'll cost us everything. We'll see incredible, incredible. Isn't this, this is, this is the crazy, this is the crazy thing about, about the supernatural, about our legacy uh, within the church. This is the same guy that got delivered from prison two times. And yet this time, God didn't deliver him from the cross. And this is that place when, even when we don't understand, even when people are saying, why, come on, do you really think, come on, the whole fishes thing, the whole like, all that, that's legend, that's folklore. God would never give them that much fish. That's, that's ridiculous. Why would God give them? That's not even fair. There's no more fish left in that stupid lake. Now all the other fishermen had to quit their jobs and go into IT. Like, like it's like, 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 like an entire species just got wiped out because you guys just caught them all. Thanks a lot. This is what we do. This is what religion does. It comes to shut down. It, it, comes, to, it comes to bring doubt. It comes to say, nah, that, 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 didn't, that didn't really happen. And, and no, God couldn't really use, use you. And no, God couldn't really really touch you but I'm telling you tonight God can and he will he can and he will he can and he will he can and he will the standard is all in every all in every all in every and even when I don't see all and even when I don't see every I know that I'm part of a generation that's seeking his face that's seeking his presence for all and every hallelujah 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 hallelujah